Oh, thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. So much clapping. Uh, welcome to Build. I am your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guests are the stars and creators of the incredible new Netflix drama, Unbelievable. I watched it all in a day. It is truly incredible. It's the story of a teenager accused by police of lying about her rape and the two detectives hunting a serial rapist three states away. Let's take a look. I know this is hard, but I need to ask you some questions about what happened. He tied my hands. He said if I screamed, he'd kill me. No signs of forced entry. Doors and windows were locked. No DNA. Not a single neighbor saw or heard a thing. He brought a blindfold, but nothing to tie her with. Would a shoelace even hold her? You think Marie made up the attack? I'm pretty positive that it happened. Pretty positive or positive? They just kept asking me the same question. How come your story doesn't add up? I wanted to go home. I don't have a victim here. It's bogus. She made it up. We're on the scene of a violent attack. Police say a masked assailant broke in while the victim was sleeping. He said, you need to be more protective of yourself. Black mask, bindings, early morning attacks. I think he's done this before. Aurora, 18 months ago. Intruder, black mask, backpack, tied her out to photos. To date, has not been caught. You see the pattern. There's a rape, new evidence, new leads, and then one by one, they dry up until he hits again. This one, we're figuring out on our own. What if he knows the stations don't talk to each other? As long as he only hits once in each town. You could have detectives from eight different departments investigating eight identical rapes with no clue. They're all chasing the same guy. Victims are all over the map, old, young, different races, so he doesn't have a type. Sure he does, women who live alone. This guy is out there, preying on the most vulnerable women he can find. Where is the outrage? This is not something people get over. This is something they carry with them forever. Even with people that you can trust, if the truth is inconvenient, they don't believe it. Everybody, please welcome Sarah Timmerman, Susanna Grant, Lisa Sholodenko, Daniel McDonald, Merritt Weaver, Caitlin Dever, and Tony Collette. Hi. Good morning. First and foremost, uh, congratulations on this incredible series. I uh, watched it all in a day. There is so much to unravel and unpack about uh, the incredibly smart decisions uh, by the directors and the creators, and as well as your performances. Uh, first and foremost, so let's start with where this came from. I know it was a ProPublica article that then became a This American Life story as well. Can you talk about how it came to the three of you and how you started developing it? It came to myself and Sarah as the article. The book hadn't been written yet, and I, I wasn't aware of the podcast yet, but the article just left off the page as something that really lent itself to this format. Uh, it, so was, it was also um, Marshall Project. So there were two writers, one for Marshall Project, one for ProPublica, who sort of found each other and realized they were covering two parts of the same story. How Ooh. ironic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and one of the things that I that I love that you've done with this is you have found ways to also really embed it in the detective genre in very smart ways. Um, simple things like uh, Tony's character's car feels like a sort of sly reference in some ways to like the masculinity and machismo of a true detective, but giving it to a female detective feels so much like you're subverting the genre in ways. Can you talk about intentionally doing that or that just sort of coming through by essentially casting two women as the leads in a detective show? Well, I mean, here's the thing. The truth is I'm not a huge consumer of that genre, so I wasn't consciously subverting any, any tropes. The real detective that inspired uh, Tony's character loves a muscle car. So uh, there doesn't? Were a few Come on now. Right. 
So there were a few things. We, we did fictionalize those characters, but there were a few details I held on to from, from a couple of them, and, and that was one of them. I just think there's something so much more, so much different about watching a female detective target practice while she is in the midst of investigating a serial rapist versus what you always get in male cop shows or male movies, which is like, my partner got killed on the job and I'm going to find the guy that did it, you know? And there, there's just something more impactful and resonant about what you're doing with this character and the context that's applied to them. Um, Lisa, talk about directing the, the, the first few episodes and being along for the ride. When did you get involved and what made you want to get involved? I mean, I, I read the story, and I think um, the first article, which was the, uh, was it the ProPublica? ProPublica. Um, and I was just riveted by it. I thought it was an amazing story. I thought it needed to be told. So I was, I was captured by that. And it was really well written. I could see it. And then I read Susanna's um, wonderful screenplay, I think the first couple episodes. Um, and I felt like I, you know, I had a contribution to give. So they brought me on, and I directed the first three episodes, and as the pilot director, you know, you bring the people that you've worked with before and sort of design it and give it a visual, you know, look and, and approach, and we cast, the three of us cast together, but I think uh, we made an amazing decision Great casting choices. each of these yeah. people, Fantastic. and um, yeah, I, I felt like we were really partners as, as setting the tone and setting the, the look, and Making it happen. Each member of the cast feels uh, like the show couldn't exist without that particular person. Um, I think Caitlin, you, you, you as well, who lead the the charge in the first episode, an incredibly fragile, heartbreaking performance. Uh, what was it like saying yes, knowing that for you know months or weeks, however long the shoot was, you were going to be occupying the space of this woman, Marie? Yeah. I mean, immediately I, I knew that it was something that I would be so lucky to be a part of. Um, when I read it, I, I sort of just, I, my, my, my heart really broke for her and I felt immediately um, emotionally connected to this person for some reason. I just, I, that's never happened before. Um, but I, I, yeah, I feel very grateful to be a part of, you know, the, the, the story and to be here with these people. But um, yeah, I, I almost had to, and thinking about there's the the prep of it there's really no way there's no formula I'm sort of learning I mean I've done dramatic roles before um but for this I sort of felt like there was there was no real way to um have it all figured out right before um I mean I definitely had a lot of like source material about Marie which was very very helpful in the in the um early stages but um Can I ask, what do you mean by having it all figured out yeah just just um because we we really took it day by day um and i didn't realize that i was gonna really stay in it emotionally um i'm not a method actor but i just sort of i i feel like there was just no way to get out of it and i think that was because i i went into it not really thinking about the way I felt anymore because I, I felt like I had to do this for Marie and I didn't need to think about my emotions um, because, it, you know, I had to do her justice. That was all that was running through my head. When you say uh, no way to get out of it, do you think that was also out of a fear of there'd be no way to get back in it or it would be so hard to get back in it if you pulled yourself out in any way? I don't know. I mean, yeah, there were certainly times that I, I had, like, you see Marie in a, in a bit of a happier state, which I think is definitely important. But I don't know if it was out of fear. I just sort of, I, I knew that I had to give it my best effort. Sometimes you have no control. It yeah. becomes consuming, and it's really not up to you. Yeah, exactly. It was sort of like that. It was sort of like that. Yeah. One of the, uh, I think, great decisions that you guys made as writers and, and as the director is within the first episode, and really no one's seen it yet, so I can't give too much away, is the decision to have the audience on Marie's side right from the beginning. It's not a mystery to us whether or not this has happened to her, so in no way are we, are you as authors exploiting her experience for the purpose of greater entertainment or greater mystery within the show? Can you talk about that decision? Because I do think that a lesser creator or a lesser writer would have, tri would have, gone, after, would have gone after that. Well, not, not exploiting the experience was really important from the get-go. You know, you have to approach this material with uh, 
with tremendous respect. Um, that said, you got to be truthful about it too. Um, not everybody. Uh, there are people who who do wonder um, about whether or not she's telling the truth on watching that first episode. And and I really I don't I don't mind that at all because I think it's really important. They do that because they are along for the ride with the detective who's questioning her. So it was really important to all of us that he not just be a uh, villain, um, the one one bad apple, and so that the, the kind of doubt he casts on her story is not unique to him. It's actually endemic in society. So, so showing that was really important. It's, it's, it was part of the way the original piece was written, too, was that you were sort of put in the shoes of the people who doubted her. You know, it's, it, there was something that kind of made you feel complicit in experiencing those doubts before you came out on the right side. Most people, I think, have the reaction you did, which is to understand that Marie is telling the truth. But it, I don't think it bothers us that some people, you know, live in doubt for a few minutes because it makes you think deeply about this uh, yeah, story. I never found myself in watching that episode and in the room with them thinking these bastards you know i could well, see where they were coming from but at the same time i also never found myself at the end of the episode going huh like turning to someone like do you think she's lying you know like it, which would have just felt horrible as a as a viewer i think for me as a director it was really important for me not to objectify the rape and not to make it one of those you know let's get titillating let's just you know make it uh anybody's guess that it was really from her point of view and it was challenging to do it because you're limited with the camera and what you can do and how you can do that. But it was, um, it, it felt like when, when I came on that decision, that felt like the truest and most restrained and respectful and dramatic way to show what was going on. I think Susanna's instinct was the same in the script, just thinking about telling the story. I, I, we, you know, it's, doing it any other way would have felt really inappropriate. Um, Merritt, you and Danielle uh, essentially serve as a juxtaposition. I mean, it felt for me within the second episode as to how a female detective would um, interview and talk to uh, a victim of sexual assault versus the way that the male detectives who just implicitly don't have the same kind of sensitivity as your character does within the first episode. And I think your scene with Danielle uh, is incredible and you have this sensitive restraint that your character brings, where she's always sort of almost at arm's length, but is also there as, um, as, a, sens as a sensitive person who's, who's there. Can you talk about developing that as a oh, part thanks. of your character? Well, um, well, thanks. And that, that was one of the things that I think I struggled with finding out how to occupy that space. She's not a therapist. She's not a counselor. She's a detective and she's doing a very specific kind of job and she's been trained adequately to do it. I don't think it's just because she's female. Um, I think that male detectives would be and are more than capable of, with the right training and sensitivity, um, doing the same kind of job. But um, I remember struggling in those uh, first episodes to find the right way to hold space for her, but also be a detective and also do a job. And I, I, I think, I've said this before, so I'm sorry to repeat myself, but in retrospect, I think that I was too aware of setting up this situation where she was doing it the right way and the other people were doing it the wrong way. And I think that I put a pressure on myself to represent something as opposed to just stay in the scene and play the page and, and play the person. But um, Do you yeah. see that when you see the scene back or is that something that you just sort of felt within the moment while you were performing? I felt it. And I realize in retrospect that that was one of the gears that I was getting caught in. Yeah, I didn't see it as a viewer. Well, thanks, I appreciate. I never that. saw it as a viewer. I don't either. mean it. Just I. absolutely I brilliant. But I also think part. I'm pivoting. Um, I all <laughs> <laughs> inelegantly, pivot, pivot. Uh, but I also think that. Um, there are also people who are more comfortable speaking with men for some reason, and there are also you know male. Uh, sexual assault survivors who, you know, I, I, I think that there is something about, um, there's something gendered here, but I also want to leave room for nuance and also leave room for the possibility that this is something that, you know, male detectives can and have and should be able to do, um, not just adequately and responsibly, but successfully. Danielle, can you talk about that scene as well? Uh, you do such a wonderful job 
with your performance of someone who's been through uh, devastating trauma, but at the same time is very capable and aware and straightforward and has somehow found a way to, uh, I don't know, I think we assume uh, the worst and something hysterical and a person wouldn't be able to function, but your character is highly functional mm -hmm. just in the aftermath of this trauma. I think what the show does so well is shows uh, the different way that people experience trauma. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's so important. There is no one right way to experience it. Um, I think that, like you were saying, the cops have very different ways of going about it, but victims, survivors, they all have very different ways of reacting as well. And I think that it was really important. I, d I didn't quite understand that when I went in. I didn't, I didn't understand how you could just function so perfectly, but there is so much more going on underneath. And that was really, um, it took a lot to kind of go into that and figure out how, how someone reacts this way. And it's everyone reacts differently. And we really see this throughout the show, but part of coping mechanism for her was to actually find all the small details and know that they were important. And that was how she coped with it. And that's really important to the story. Um, Tony, you and uh, Merritt make incredible detectives together. Yes, we I do. Know, I, I love it. Yes, I, do. The best. I know that this is, you know, based on a real article and you probably don't want to make this a continuing series. But if there's any way to extract your characters from the real thing and make a detective show between the two of you, I would absolutely uh, yeah, let's love do that. It. And watch Everybody it. in? I'm in. We used to joke about it on the set. I mean, it works perfectly. That, like I said, I, I was kind of alluding to it when I was talking about the muscle car and your character shooting like target practice. But when the two of you are together and you even get like very detective show lines, which I love that the show wasn't afraid to give you every now and then, you just nail it perfectly. Oh, that's so nice. I mean, I loved working with Merritt. I really I did. did. It was oh, so did. easy and so <laughs> interesting. Oh, <laughs> Interesting. Well, now we have to like, so why was it so interesting? Oh, you know, she was talking about that internal grind. That was just one of them. <laughs> no, she's very hard on herself because she's a perfectionist and we wanted to get this right. There is a certain amount of yeah. obligation here and responsibility. respect, responsibility. And, and that is, um, it can kind of do your head in. So we just focused on every moment and tried to make every moment real. And they're very different women. They work differently. I'm, you know, uh, my character's more of a lone wolf and she's kind of built up a bit of a brick wall and it takes a while to let her in because she's not good at being vulnerable or sharing her, her work and her space. And um, it, it becomes an incredible uh, partnership and... Um, yeah, I, I too am so honoured to be a part of this. It's it's a really important story, and I think it's been handled so sensitively and so um, beautifully in terms of creativity, you know. Um, but the fact that it is, you know, based on a true story and these things happened to people is um, it's a lot. It's weighted, and uh, I I didn't want to just be a character, be a detective. I wanted to create a whole person mm -hmm. and feel that there is real humanity here, and that's why there's no black and white. It's it is all very grey, um, in a in a fantastic way. Well, your character even starts to sort of blur the lines of what is legally admissible while being a detect while being uh, a detective and being on the force in terms of. I don't want to again give anything too much away, but exploiting her husband for his resources. She'll do anything. I mean, right. they're so dedicated to their to their job, and we talked about being consumed. These women are completely consumed and dedicated to what they're doing. Are you not the type of person who gets completely consumed with your performances? I can. You can. I think it was different for me on this one because usually I am experience all, I'm experiencing all the emotion, but I felt like the fix-it person on this one and I didn't, I didn't have to go through what you had to go through. So it was a very different experience for me, actually. And did you find that in, uh, when you were performing together in scenes that you just had different approaches in some ways because of the differences of the characters? I'm sure we had different approaches, but... I mean, we didn't, like, talk about it. We just no. did it. Was wasn't that indulgent bad? in that way. Some things say. just have to be real in the moment, right? So you've almost got to, even if you are prepared, you've got to, you sound like such an actor, you do have to let go of it and just allow that moment to breathe and live. And that's how you get something real. For, for us, there was one um, 
seven minute scene in the in the bay of a car and between the two of them and is that uh, the scene, the sta- the stakeout scene? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And and I'm not giving too much. Honestly, away. no. But for I think for us, we could have seen it gone on twice as long. Just watching the two of them together okay. was we were worried beforehand because it was seven minutes in a car. And in the end, um, Michael Jenner, who directed it, he said, "This is a seven minute scene you've given me." And we it, kept saying, "No, I, trust me, trust it'll work." And he'd say, "It's well, seven you, minutes and, of talking," and we said. It'll work. People and then told he me got, seven and, minutes in life. Hey. Yeah, and then he and got into the built editing up room. to this moment for so long. I mean, it, it's a moment of extreme vulnerability for two two characters who have who haven't been vulnerable yet on screen for this whole show. Yeah, some of my favorite scenes to shoot uh, were the ones with Tony where where all of a sudden we get a little more air in, a little more room and a little space to breathe and experience ourselves and each other as people just because so much of, of the work that our characters are doing story-wise on this show is this like relentless task of like pursuit, 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 go, 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 find, 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 work, work, work. And it was nice, I think, as a character and as an actor to all of a sudden let the shoulders down and get to experience a little room. And I loved... I loved my character's relationship with Grace, and I loved working with Tony. Um, so, <laughs> the end. I loved I loved your character's relationship and yours as well. Uh, relationships with your husbands, these uh, which I thought were very well written, supportive men who also could only support to a certain extent and had to back off at certain times, and they were very response, just very well written, rounded. Good guys. I hate to bring up the guys on like a female fronted series. Someone no. on Twitter is going to be like, "Of course, Ricky wants to talk about the men." No, it's but really important. All of the characters. It was right. really yeah. important women. that it not that it not be a completely gendered um, division between who does the right thing and who does the wrong thing in the show, because that's not how it is in life. You know, there are things, there are qualities that that women bring to a work that that perhaps. Men don't have as accessible, but but as Merritt was saying, men are completely capable of doing yeah. this work, and many men do, many good men do. So it was really important to show that these women were surrounded by and supported by a lot of really good, interesting, complex men as well. And that's true about the project more broadly. You know, it, it started with the work of two incredible journalists who happened to be men who could not be more dedicated to the truth of Marie's story. And my partner, Carl Beverly, is a man, and Michael Dinner was there, and we had DPs. So it wasn't meant to be a show by women. It's, this is not a sexual assault, is not something exclusively that relates to women. This was a story about people. And based on a true story, so right. these women were married to, you know, really supportive men that were also in the law yep. and um, had a contribution and cared. And so I think it came together nicely in the right way. And um, the balance wondering. in the script was, was there. I'm really glad it came through. One of the other elements of it, and it's a rarity both within the confines of a, of a movie or even miniseries or in a show, is that in all of these tangents that uh, these detectives go down, there's always a space, and even within uh, Marie's life, for people to be decent. Even the people who are doing maybe, I mean, not the worst of the worst in this, but uh, her boss, who is you know kind of driving her crazy and eventually pushes her to the brink, you also understand where she's coming from, and she's not a villain or a horrible person. There's room for everybody's nuance within these characters. How hard is that as creators and writers to make sure that that room is there? Because the rules of drama are always like, you want an argument, or you want a villain, and you need someone well, going look, against something. The rules of drama were, this, this story came with them, um, baked into it, you know. There was, there was a, a ticking clock. There was, a, you know, somebody you're trying to catch. So, so you ha- we had a really great plot handed to us, which afforded us uh, in the in the writing and creation of it the room to show the nuance. And um, it, uh, you know, it, it's it's a much less interesting story if people are black and white and cut and dry you know the, the this this show addresses misconceptions that we as a culture share about rape rape victims and um it, if it's one bad apple who's got that that one bad idea that's not interesting but if you can build a show in which good people 
make really bad decisions, I think it, it opens the door to a much more interesting conversation. How are we all responsible for this, you know? Um, did you want to say something? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go to the audience for some questions. Who has a question? Hey. Uh, hi, thank you so much. Um, as an aspiring director, it's really nice to see all females uh, representing a show. So it's uh, really nice. Thank you. And um, I was wondering, how is it working on a show mainly um, directed by women? And to Caitlin specifically, how is it to um, play this character that is very, that has a lot to, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> very, it's a lot yeah. to care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, I don't really know. I mean, it's sort of, I, I, I just, again, I just felt um, a sort of responsibility. Um, but then again, I didn't want to put too much pressure on it. At the same time, I didn't want to put too much pressure on myself. But I also knew that I, I had to get it right for her. And I was really thinking about her the whole time. Um, but I, I, when I say I stayed in it, I did stay in it. And I, there were a lot of difficult scenes. And um, But I also say that lightly because it is, it, it is difficult. But what I was doing every day on set and shooting these scenes was nothing in comparison to what um, people um, dealing with sexual assault actually go through in real life and what Marie went through in real life. So um, yes, it was very difficult for me, but I also just had to keep that in mind the whole time. And everyone that I was working with was also so um, comforting and engaged and um, we were always having conversations to make sure everyone was very comfortable. And yeah, and that makes all the difference. Directors. I mean, we have three directors, two of which were women, and it's just a matter of working with a great fucking director. I mean, it's a sec you can't make sexist decisions and just hire women because they're women. That's crazy. So we were lucky to have three great directors. What does a what does a great director do for you? You've worked with some of the best directors there there are. What does a great director usually do for you? Uh, just help you to realize the moment. They know when to step in and say something that helps make it real for you and they also know when to step right out <laughs> would you say that stepping out is more important sometimes than stepping in it's all important it's so collaborative beautifully collaborative that's why i love doing what i do um and it's just a it's a you figure out your way to communicate and uh it can be it can be really exciting it's very clear when somebody is is not helping or um uh, doesn't feel confident in what they're doing. So when you get to work with a great director, they're just as married to the material as you are. They're just as steeped in it and it just seems to develop a shorthand and you feel like you're sharing the experience and not so alone. Uh, one more question. Awesome. Hi, this is a question from our website, buildseries.com. Do you recommend reading the ProPublica article and listening to This American Life before or after watching? I think it's worth listening and reading beforehand, I think. And I would, would say, say watch us first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Do it all. Either Do way. it all. They're all. No and then there's a, there's a book as well, which is also worth reading. Okay. Um, but wait for the book so, until after. Yes. Yeah. But, but definitely uh, read and listen. Um, well, the uh, series premieres on uh, Netflix September 13th. I believe that's this Friday, correct? And as I've said a number of times, it's amazing, absolutely incredible and essential work. Thank you so much for being here and talking to me about it. Uh, it's called Unbelievable, and it's on Netflix this Friday. Everybody give them a huge round of applause for coming by. Thank you. Thank you for having us.